This tree was planted in 1965. This is actually a seedling from the tree on the island of Kos under which Hippocrates taught his medical students. It came originally from the Middle East and was taken across Europe by the great tyrant of Syracuse all the way up to Calais and eventually came to England in about 1600. The first time that London plane ever appeared was in the nursery of John Tradescant in about 1650 uh, in Vauxhall as a naturally occurring hybrid between the Oriental plane and the American plane which he introduced from Virginia to England. And like many plants which have a medicinal use, it's also quite toxic in that the hairs from the leaves and the furs from the seeds and flowers are very irritating and can cause hay fever, skin rashes and things like that. It has slightly different leaves from uh, the London plane. If you look up here, you can see the shape of the leaves and the hanging down, the little flowers and seed heads. Uh, and you can see three to five of these little balls hanging down quite different from the London plane, two balls hanging down, and the American plane, one ball hanging down. There are some in Italy which have a circumference of over 80 feet. And it's said that Caligula, the Roman emperor, used to dine inside the hollow tree of an of a, uh, oriental plane with a dozen people and all the servants serving around him. And they were grown specially because they were so favoured for their shade and they were grown outside temples and palaces and introduced specifically for this purpose. The difference between the Oriental Plain and the London Plain is of course in the trunk and the trunk is much more corrugated and doesn't have that flaky bark which you see in the London Plain and it's much more like an oak tree with its rigid uh, grooves all the way up it but some of the horizontal branches will have flaky bark as well. Now I'm going to take you to see two other trees which were planted in the garden many years ago when the college first moved here. And there are these two trees up here. And they're named after Captain John Winter, who sailed with Francis Drake in 1576 down the Atlantic, down to Tierra del Fuego, to go round uh, the, the tip of South America, to go up the Pacific coast, to raid the Spanish shipping, capture the galleons and so forth. Drake was extremely successful and went back across the Pacific to England with enough bullion and stolen ships to pay off England's national debt. Winter's men weren't so lucky. They got scurvy. Their gums were bleeding, their skin was bleeding. It was horrible. And they were hungry and they ate the berries off this tree. They were very bitter so they boiled them up with honey and within 10 days their scurvy had gone. And they realised that this tree was a cure for scurvy. And the reason it worked is because it contains vitamin C. They didn't know about vitamin C until about 1920. And they came back to England with the bark of this tree, which has been called winter's bark ever since. And for 200 years, until lemons came in, winter's bark was the treatment for scurvy. The fact that you had to sail for nine months down the Atlantic and nine months back made it rather hard to come by. Let me go to a much older plant, which has been used medicinally for many years. Let's go and look at the olive tree. It's down here. This is the European olive tree and it's been cultivated for millennia. This olive tree was planted here in the college and show the friendship which existed between us and the apothecaries. It was seen as a treatment for leprosy. Nowadays the use of the olive oil for cooking and as a healthy food to help you live longer is well established. And we've got some fruit just coming here. They're still green. By about December or February they'll be black. This is a sassafras tree. It comes from North America and from China and all around that part of the Northern Hemisphere. And it's a wonderful tree, it makes great forests and it has wonderful colour and it's just beginning to change and to die back and lose its leaves for the autumn. But it's fragrant and if you crush the leaves and smell them, they have a lovely fragrance. And it was used as a flavouring for root beer, a sort of childhood drink, until they found that if you fed it to rats, they develop cancer. Now rats will develop cancer if you look at them sideways, so it was bad science. But anyway, it's no longer used in any quantity as a flavouring. If you want to make uh, a fragrance from it, distill the leaves or you distill the roots and you boil it off and you collect the distillate and you have an oil. And the oil contains a chemical called saffron. And saffron oil is wonderful because 20,000 tonnes of the leaf of this are harvested every year and made into saffron oil 
and from safrole oil they make ecstasy. We have here a group of members of the citrus family, lemons and grapefruits. Dr. Lind uh, introduced uh, lemons and oranges for the treatment of scurvy in about 1750. And he's always been the man who's been identifying lemons for scurvy. John Parkinson, in his book, Theatrum Botanicum, says it's an ideal treatment for preventing scurvy in sailors. Grapefruit is important in modern medicine. The liver is there to clean the blood of strange and foreign chemicals, including medicines. And if you take grapefruit, it interferes with the liver's ability to do that. If you're taking statins, you shouldn't take grapefruit because grapefruit will interfere with the metabolism of statins, stop them being destroyed by the liver, and the level of statins will build up in your blood and will get to a toxic level. This is Punica granatum, the pomegranate. This one was planted in 1977 to celebrate the Queen's Jubilee. And of course it grows widely over the Middle East and is imported from the Middle East into Italy. Various cultivars have been grown in England for over 400 years. This one will survive probably minus 10 degrees of frost. The fruit has traditionally been used as a symbol of fertility because of the millions of seeds in it. The fruit juice was seen as cooling and as a treatment for fevers under the Hippocratic theory that a cool, cold, refreshing drink was an antidote to the excess of the hot humours which you had in fevers. Much preferable than having two pints of blood taken off you, which was the Galenic alternative. And that is why we have the pomegranate on the college coat of arms, as its symbol of its use for treating fevers. And the bark of this was very interesting because they made a tea from it and you drank it and it killed your intestinal worms. When you made a tea from it, you had a dark brown liquid and you could use that as an ink because it didn't fade in sunlight and made a permanent ink and you could write to your doctor and say, Dear doctor, thank you very much, the treatments work nicely. This is the dwarf pomegranate, Punica granatum nana, and it is just a mutation of the main pomegranate. And it is beautiful. It produces a little hedge with tiny leaves. Flowers are very beautiful. The hedge is lovely, but the fruits are too small to have any medicinal use. It flowers from about August, really right through until the first frosts. We're now going to go and look at this tree over here, which is the ginkgo tree. This is ginkgo biloba, the last surviving tree of the most ancient tree on the planet. Ginkgos used to be forests which covered the Pliocene era before the first hominids appeared. It existed at the time of the dinosaurs. It is a truly ancient tree. It's almost extinct in the wild now, but cultivated around the world. It antedates almost all the other trees and plants on the planet. It's got veins which run like a fan, like a hand, spreading out. Whereas monocots have veins which run parallel to each other and dicots have veins which are, form a riti, a branching network. And because it's such an ancient plant, the Chinese use it for treating ancient diseases. Tincture of ginkgo is used for Alzheimer's in China. And it does increase cerebral blood flow. And you might think that cerebral blood flow being increased would be a help to Alzheimer's. But in Alzheimer's, the cells are dead. And there is absolutely no point in increasing the blood flow to dead cells. It doesn't make them work any more than watering concrete will make it grow mustard and cress. When I was telling this story once on a garden tour, a young Polish lady who worked here, a girl of 25, came up to me and said, Oakley, you know nothing. It's an aphrodisiac. I said, what do you mean it's an aphrodisiac? She said, don't you know about the doctrine of signatures? The creator signed everything to show what it's used for. It's got heart-shaped leaves. Oh, I said, how does that work? She says, do I have to tell you everything? When I go to bed with my boyfriend, I put this under my pillow and he makes love to me. It never fails. And at this point, when I'm taking a garden tour, I leave the leaf behind, just behind me. And I say, I'm going to leave it here. And if any of you feel you need it, please take it. I won't be looking. <laughs>